Good morning, everybody. I'm going to be talking about creating a meaningful metaverse. Who has the map? At a talk I gave in the ancient days of 1994, I described a ubiquitous virtual reality with full immersion, interactivity, and involvement, a harbinger of a future metaverse. Though that future was hardly possible back then, many of us took on various aspects of paving the way for it to happen someday. And now, decades later, we stand on the precipice of defining what it might truly become. For this talk, I will riff on the latest metaverse speculations and what might be possible if our map is more about the traveler than the highway system. And just to be clear, I will be using the term metaverse throughout this talk, even though it is hyped and not fully defined. It's still the simplest way to refer to the concepts I will be covering. Why is this doing this? All right, I'm gonna start over right here. So you're gonna to have to cut. This is a starting point, okay? Evidently the slides don't go on their own. I'm gonna try that again, okay. Jeez, you can't go back. Jeez, just don't remember this. Okay, now it's very good. All right, we're going to start here. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to be talking about creating a meaningful metaverse. Who has the map? In a talk I gave in the ancient days of 1994, I described a ubiquitous virtual reality with full immersion interactivity and involvement, a harbinger of future metaverse. Though that future was hardly possible back then, many of us took on various aspects of paving the way for it to happen someday. And now decades later, we stand on the precipice of defining what it might truly become. For this talk, I will riff on the latest metaverse speculations and what might be possible if our map is more about the travelers than the highway system itself. And just to be clear, I will be using the term metaverse throughout this talk, even though it is hyped and not fully defined, because it is still the simplest way to refer to the concepts I will be covering. We are writing the history of the metaverse, even as we speak here this week. Of course, many others also have their pens dipped in that ink. What bits of everyone's contributions will make it to the final accounting? Well, that depends on the future that we want and the voices that we raise to make that future. As with so much today, what we hear is the stuff that is the loudest, not necessarily the best. It is the volume that first captures our attention, not the music. The volume, not the music. And there are many loud voices to be sure, and it's hard to get away from them. But there is also power in numbers, vast numbers of quieter voices. As we rush headlong into that much hyped and promised metaverse, we need to take a look at it from another direction, another dimension. The 19th century English romantic poet, William Wordsworth wrote these lines in 1802. The world is too much with us late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. At the turn of the 19th century, he was referring to the rise of the first wave of global industrialization, which he criticized for being absorbed primarily by materialism, the quest for things. He lamented how it usurped the connection that humans once had with nature. He lamented this rupture because it relegated the softer and more psychological aspects of human beings to a second class status, or it ignored them altogether. The words of Wordsworth's poem also ring true for the coming and perhaps controversial advances in today's rise of the metaverse. 
it may be too soon to start lamenting this rise since it's barely begun, but there certainly is a disconnect forming between the companies that want to benefit financially from the metaverse and those who might want to incorporate it into the ebb and flow of our basic human existence. What is a metaverse? There are so many definitions out there right now, defining something that does not yet truly exist. But I think Dean Takahashi has a pretty good one. He says, I would define the metaverse as a shared, persistent, real-time and social online space that has its own economy and feels like you're inside an immersive and interconnected world. And it's not just one world, it's a whole collection of them. But I admit that we're still pretty confused and getting more confused every day. Is this metaverse a promised land or simply our latest distraction or enticement? That may just depend on where you find your meaning in the life you are living. More on that later. We might describe the metaverse as a mirror for the zeitgeist of our time. What is going on in the world is very important in how we can even imagine something as vast as the metaverse. And right now, this metaverse seems like it's taking on much of what we're seeing happening in the physical world. Think of this. We have found a way to create realities not based on nature but still hitting the sensors that we have developed over eons of human evolution. We are the blind men and the elephant. And in our blindness, it's what you touch, what you desire, that becomes the filter for how you see the metaverse. You might want endless entertainment or distraction. And if that's so, then that's how you see the metaverse. If you desire easy or vast profits, then that's how you see the metaverse. If what you see is a way to connect humanity, then that is how you see the metaverse. The street finds its own use for things, but we have given up so much power that should be in our hands, not the corporations. And for a fairly substantial overview of what is out there today playing in the metaverse landscape, I recommend to you Nick Mitham's Metaverse Universe charts, which he publishes quarterly. These are fascinating snapshots of what's going on. It's estimated that the metaverse bandwagon has over 500 applications that have adopted a keyword of metaverse, with games accounting for nearly 20% of these. I personally think that's a pretty lowball number. Why does everybody want on this seemingly crazy train? Fundamentally, I see two reasons emerging. For the good it could do in better connecting humanity, or for the money to be made by getting into this game early. Remember, what we see reflects the zeitgeist of our time. Let's talk about the second of these possibilities first, the money that could be made. The general consensus is that many companies are interested in the metaverse because there is money to be made there. Facebook has unapologetically been an advertising company mostly. They monetize user data, 3 billion global users, us. They monetize each and every one of us that use their platforms. Granted, we get to use platforms for free, but what are we giving up with this deep rooted surveillance capitalism? Bits of ourselves are algorithmically attached to something that we might desire. And then that gets fed back to us with a pretty bow in exchange for our click. This surveillance capitalism has a very long and strong leash. A company making billions of dollars from us being on that leash is not likely to let us off of it. So why is Meta doing what they are doing? Given their track record to date, it's probably not about making customers happy as they said in their launch, but more about making money, getting that valuable click, click, click. And they even employ psychological methods to ensure the clicks last as long as possible. And this is still legal. I'm reminded of subliminal advertising in the 1980s. In 1974, the FCC, held hearings about the perceived threat of subliminal advertising 
and issued a policy statement saying that subliminal perception was deceptive and, quote, contrary to the public interest. A, a 2018 roadmap document that was internal to Facebook imagined users floating through a digital universe of virtual ads filled with virtual goods that people buy. There would be virtual people that they would marry while spending as little time as possible in the so-called meat purse, referring to the real world because humans are made of flesh and blood. I've often said that the killer, not the killer app, the killer for the metaverse is that it must make lots and lots of money. First of all, the technological herder hurdles towards a functioning metaverse like this, or in Takahashi's definition, are many and not easily solved. Philip Rosedale, creator of Second Life, states that many of the technological problems that keep virtual worlds from getting big are still there. And he's probably the most knowledgeable person in the world about what is needed to enable a metaverse. What are some of these challenges? Interoperability, capacity, transludic avatars that keep their looks between place, sovereign identities, economics, privacy, safety, and more that I don't have time to go into today. But we will certainly be hearing more about these in the weeks and years to come. Who should be creating this? It won't emerge fully blown from the brow of some technological Zeus company. Aspects like those I just mentioned, like interoperability, that take the techies. They take lots of techies because much of this requires vast technological advances. Building the metaverse, this complex ecosystem of hardware, services, connectivity, community, governance, ethics, interoperability, and more takes a community or communities. Let's just look at the economic underpinnings of the metaverse as an example. The complex ecosystem of the metaverse. If you are trying to keep up with the emergence of the first wave of metaverse hopefuls, you cannot get away from the concept of building a consumer economy based on NFTs and some variation of cryptocurrency. The hype around these new business models has been almost unbearable, with any naysayers quickly drowned out by the loudness of the voices who have staked their fortunes and their futures on this. Why are some people so excited about crypto? It is the newest gold rush and get quick rich scheme. There is a huge fear of missing out since we have been duped into thinking that getting something first or over others is actually a very valuable thing. It's something to be valued. But actually the fear of missing out is very real because the model behind the scheme only favors those who get in early and sell and resell and drive up prices from which they benefit. But it is an unsustainable and corrosive business model on which to base the economies of the coming metaverse. These are the fallacies that we are fed, sadly part of today's world and not just for the encrypted NFTs. Endless growth is both possible and desirable. Money is the surest metric and what's good for the top 1% surely must be good for, human, for all of humankind, providing some sort of largesse to the other 90% of humanity. But this attitude is unsustainable in so many ways and its collapse is undeniably inevitable. Political, sociological, economic problems, these will not be escaped by diving into a virtual world. So now we'll talk about democratization. A truly functioning metaverse that people will flock to takes more than the technological prowess and more than a gold rush economy. It requires softer aspects of being human. Absolutely. What we need is democratization for a metaverse to thrive. What would democratization mean? First of all, access for all, regardless of the depth of their wallets. Second, the ability to make decisions about what is valuable in the content and the affordances of the world. 
And this may not be one thing at a top level. Do we have one government for the globe or one banking system? People don't recognize how incredibly unhealthy it is to have awfully powerful companies and institutions exist at that top level. Think local may be the most successful route. Are the titans of industry and government making it possible for the street, that's us, to find our own use for things? Galloway says metaverses will become real when we live in them, whether for 20 minutes or for the bulk of our lives. They will evolve and morph with the push and pull of the tidal forces of the people that use them. So who should be building this, I ask again? The people who inhabit and use it should have a huge say. We don't have to believe the metaverse's prime directive is to make money for some small percentage of humanity. We can base our involvement in it on other aspects of value, trust, more human-centric aspects, kindness, caring, ritual, dreaming, expanding our minds, healing our afflictions, sharing and filling basic human needs. We are all creators of the metaverse. The metaverse is meant to be a communion of humanity. So building for humanity. If I go back to Wordsworth's quote, remember he was motivated by what he saw happening to humanity with the industrial revolution. Could he stop it? No. And I'm not even sure that that is what he was trying to do. And just to be clear, I'm not advocating in any way to stop the momentum or progress for a future metaverse. But just reminding us not to forget the things that give value to our lives as humans, as humankind. As Sophocles said, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. And that's the precipice we're teetering on. The possible vastness of a metaverse, whatever it will be. If it's done right, or even if it's done wrong, it will be vast and it will present huge challenges and maybe, hopefully, huge benefits. We don't know yet. We have to wait for it to evolve, but we can steer it. And there is power in the numbers of humankind. Let's not forget this. We have the power to define it. We being the operative word. It is our stories that will create the metaverse. We who live in that space. Donna Haraway says it matters what stories make worlds and what worlds make stories. So the long game, what do we, the users, no, no, the participants want it to be? And I'd like to remind everyone to be careful what words you use. Words have a tendency to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If inhabitants of the metaverse are known as consumers, well, consume means to destroy or expend or use up or devour or destroy by different means, such as decomposition or burning. To spend, to spend things wastefully like money. And if we call them users, users can exhaust what they are using. They can wear out or consume completely. They can become addicted to what they use. And given the way the small dopamine hits affect us right now, user might actually be the most correct term of all. We have to change that. All of this seems very one way. What does what we are using do for us besides dopamine hits? I would rather use the term participate which implies more of a two-way street. It's not just about taking, but perhaps also about giving back or contributing in some way. And this idea of making contributions is key to creating a meaningful metaverse. A metaverse, if done right, is not just a destination or a space, it is a society. A society is a structured system of human organization. The group provides value identity, protection, continuity, security, social connection, and support, and requires of its members in return, respect, cooperation, and participation. 
The metaverse will become part of our lives when it provides vital uses for its citizens. Uses such as could be entertainment, could be an information portal, could be a social catalyst, could be a spiritual renewal place. So creating a meaningful metaverse, well, the techies can build the space, but it takes people to transform that space into place. For some, the open metaverse is the promised land where tech monopolies would be brought to heel and everyone would be in charge of their own data and digital assets and participants would be involved in setting the course of this network as a whole. It's a tentative hypothetical project, this open metaverse. But one thing about it is clear, big tech should not be in control. A metaverse built by them would be no metaverse at all. We should instead transform the space of the metaverse into place. Places are formed by the mix of the ethereal nature of space and our embodied experiences within those, like water and dust forming clouds. Space is possibility. Place is what we make of that possibility by living in it. And until we live in it, the metaverse is only possibility. Whatever is offered, live in it well. The metaverse is a frontier. And in that regard, there is no map. We are discovering the way with each step. Companies may surge ahead and build the superhighways that direct and guide us to embrace their version of this vision. But just like how pathways in college campuses are often determined by the lines trampled by students finding their most useful ways around that campus, the metaverse will become meaningful by well-trodden, trampled ways in which we use it. Such paths are called desire paths or trample plots. And that to me is the best way for maps for the coming metaverse to emerge through the uses that actually mean something to us as humans. These maps can be straight, quick, and efficient, or they can travel through a landscape of desire and meaning. Desire paths are a living snapshot of that constantly evolving relationship between people and place. They are the maps that emerge from multitudes of ongoing moments of participation, from desires that cannot be foretold, from the very essence of a human being's wants, goals, and need for communion with others. These are the maps that will constitute the true metaverse, one that is truly humanity first. In conclusion, I'll reiterate a few of the lessons from my talk. The metaverse becomes real only when we are in place within it and live it, whether for isolated minutes or for much of our lives. The metaverse is a living medium because of this emplacement and because it is a process, not a fully finished creation. It's until we experience it, it becomes real. So who decides what goes into a living medium? It doesn't matter what gets put in if it's not meaningful to the citizens, if it doesn't enhance their lives with kindness, caring, ritual, and meaning. It must both fill and go beyond basic human needs. We cannot fully predict the ultimate direction for the metaverse, for it is both elusive and potentially far reaching. The experiences we create must type into deeply seated human needs and desires for it to become fully what it could be. We are all creators of the metaverse. It can be a communion of humanity, our next phase of evolution. What might a fully executed meta metaverse mean for humanity? Is it a port in a storm or the storm itself? Can it accelerate our evolution or forestall it? Will it maddeningly present too many choices, not enough or none at all? Where is the free will we think we have? Is this being considered in those who are jumping in to build it? Or are we just there to be manipulated? We are so much more than bags of DNA with dollar signs. 
The stakes are beyond ethics. This is our journey from dependency to autonomy, from technological toddlers to fully functional technological citizens. The metaverse has no inherent value in and of itself. It is up to us how we inhabit it, how it affects us, and how we in turn affect it. Its value comes from the participants and we are the ones who make the useful and meaningful maps, not the companies trying to build the superhighways. The desire paths of the metaverse are still ours to create. Thank you.